And here we are for another video from Never a Truer Word. This time looking at Ian Bailey. He's given an interview recently to a podcast. What's really going on in the words that he says? This is a live video, so uh, if you want to uh, ask any questions or make any comments on what you see in Ian Bailey's words, then feel free. Just drop them in the live chat. I'd be delighted to deal with any questions or comments that come up. If you're watching this on replay, then get involved in the comments as well, because statement analysis like this is always better when collaboration goes on. Before we begin, I've got a couple of questions to ask you. You can drop your answers in the chat if you like or in the comments or just keep them to yourselves and we will deal with your answers a little bit later. And I'm guessing you're here because you're interested in this story or potentially you're here because you've got an interest in true crime. So here's a couple of questions for you. What consequence should the killer of the four college students in Idaho face? What, what consequence should the, the person that killed those four college students in Idaho, what, what consequences should they face? And the second question, how do you feel about the person who killed Gabby Petito? That's the person who killed Gabby Petito. How do you feel about that person? You can either drop your uh, answers in the, the chat if you want or, or in the comments or just keep them to yourself. They will become pertinent later on. Sophie Toscan de Plantier was murdered in December 1996 in West Cork in Ireland. And this is part of getting justice for Sophie because we want to find out what happened to her. And finding out what happened to Sophie, I think, is the most important thing, both for Sophie and for her family. As of yet, in Ireland, no one has been charged or convicted, obviously, if no one's been charged, of her murder. So it's very much a crime that is still up in the air with, with no... No one brought to justice for it, shall we say. If you want to hear a little bit more about the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier, including hearing from people who were around at the time and observed things at the time, and the person that we're going to talk about tonight, Ian Bailey, there is a great podcast called Words of West Cork. I can say great because I made it modestly. It's very interesting, and it delves into the statements of people around this crime. You can find that at podcast.neveratruerword.com if you want to see it. So that brings us to Ian Bailey. There he is. And he's an eccentric figure, is, is Ian Bailey. Um, he was um, alleged to by some people to have been involved in the murder of Sophie, suspected by some people of being involved in the murder of Sophie. He has always denied he has had any part in the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier. And he's become a bit of a figure of fun, which isn't right, because one of two things have happened here. He, either Ian Bailey's an innocent man, and if he is an innocent man, his life has been ruined by these false allegations and this suspicion that surrounded him. And if that is the truth, then it's a truly sad story. Over a quarter of a century, under wrongful suspicion and, and ruined by false allegations, so that would be really sad. I guess the, the other thing that could be true is he's a horrible murderer, and he's gone unpunished for any crime that that horrible murderer has committed. But he's got questions to answer, reasonable questions to answer about what went on with him around the time of Sophie's murder. Which either one of those things are true, whether he's an innocent man who's been falsely accused of murder or whether he's got those bigger questions to answer, he is going to be under stress. And we're going to see a lot of stress when we come to analyse Ian's words. And I want you to remember, stress and being under stress doesn't necessarily mean that he's guilty. An innocent person denying any involvement in a murder that, that there are suspicions around would be under stress as well. And as I said, Ian has always and still does deny any involvement in the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier. We're going to analyse the words that he has used in a podcast uh, recently, and we're only going to look at the words, and we're going to look at them using a couple of the tactics of something called truthful deception. And those are that generally we hate lying. People hate lying in general. We'd rather tell the truth. What we might do, though, is hide things that we, won't, that we don't want to talk about so that we don't have to tell lies. We don't have to explain things that we don't want to talk about. So we, in general, we hate lying. We would rather tell the truth, but we're quite happy to be selective for that truth and only tell certain things. And if we are lying, the truth will leak out in our words. And if we can spot these tactics carefully analyzing the words that people choose to use. The words we use are not accidental. And if we analyze them pedantically and very carefully, we can find out a little bit more about what's going on. 
to be very clear here, we're not looking for one misspeak. We all do silly things and say things that we didn't mean to. I'm doing a live video right now. It's highly likely at some point I'll say the wrong thing or phrase something in the wrong way. One misspeak doesn't mean you are a cold-blooded murderer. What we're looking for is repeated patterns of behavior around word choice. I think it's really important to say this video only deals with the words. So I know there's lots of speculation and allegations are out there. This is not the place for them. This is only about the words of Ian Bailey. The full podcast is a really good interview with Ian Bailey. He's not let off the hook at all. So you can listen to the full podcast. There's a link in the description to this video. I urge you to do that. I've been selective with what I picked out here. I've picked out the answers that interest me most. The full interview is worth listening to. And please remember when you do, I've only selected some of what was said in the interview. So Ian Bailey, well, former journalist, fancies himself as a poet, so he thinks he has, well, he certainly has a way with words. He certainly understands the pictures and that can be painted with words and the power of words as well. So we're going to have to get around some of that when we analyse his words. For example, here's just something I pulled out of the, the interview. He's asked by the interviewer, should anyone have any reason to fear you? And he says, no, absolutely not at all. The only people who that need to be afraid of me are those who lied and conspired to create a false narrative, but nobody else should. What do you spot there? Well, first of all, if the question had been asked of him, should anyone have had any reason to fear you? And he said, no, that's quite believable. That's quite direct. It's a yes, no question. He, you can say yes, they should, or no, they shouldn't. And he says, no. But then he doubles down on that no. He says, no, absolutely not at all. And the more someone says no to a question like that, so if they went, no, absolutely not at all, they shouldn't, no way, no, no, no. The more no's you put in there, the more deceptive an answer is likely to be. So he's put in a couple of no's there with no, absolutely not at all. But then this is typical Ian Bailey here. After saying no one should fear him, no, absolutely not at all, he then says, the only people that need to be afraid of me are those who lied. So after saying no one should be afraid of him, he then tells us the group of people who should be afraid of him. And that's that's just typical Ian Bailey. We'll see time and time again as we go through his words, he gives what looks like a firm and robust denial. But if you actually analyze the words he uses, he's they're very qualified. They're not, they're weak denials. They're, they're not strong at all. Louise, uh, Laura, I beg your pardon, Laura. Laura says present tense. So I think um, when you're talking about that, um, the only people that, says, yes, he is asked in the past tense, should anyone have had reason to fear you? And he talks now and says, the only people that need to fear me are. So he's talking in present tense. Yeah, good spot there, Laura. So let's go on with the interview then. And um, there's so much to spot. I won't, I won't pull up everything I spot. If you do spot anything like Laura did, stick it in the stick it in the. Uh, yeah, Laura's celebrating that she spotted something. If you spot more, Laura or anyone else is watching, stick it in the the chat or stick it in the comments as well. Uh, the interviewer begins, um, and he's been setting the scene, telling the story of the murder, and he says to Ian Bailey, "You were arrested, and you." vehemently denied it the whole way through, and it became an absolute media circus surrounding you. May I ask you just, and Ian Bailey interrupts, and always, always pay attention when someone interrupts. It means they're telling a story. It means they're, they're using words that they want to use. They want to get ahead of the question, maybe avoid where, where, where he knows the question is going, and say something to get across a message that he wants to get across. And, and Ian Bailey interrupts with, I, 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 I mean, now that stutter on the eye, that's definite stress. As I said, it doesn't indicate anything other than stress. So he says, I, I, I mean, and then he splutters. L let's put it in context, okay? I, I'll say this, and I said this 1,000 times. I have nothing on my conscience. I have nothing to do with this sad, sad murder of Madame de Plantier. I was the lead reporter on it. I was uh, in the area, former Fleet Street investigator. I worked with the Sunday Times Insight team and various other newspapers and organizations, and I was the lead journalist on it. And then within, I think, five weeks of the crime, I was first arrested on the 11th of February, 1997, as was my partner, Jules, and we were both given a very, very hard, rough time by the uh, interrogating guards. And then 12 months later, I was arrested again. And then I think maybe five years after the first arrest, Jules was arrested for a second time. So we've been through, put through an awful lot of unnecessary um, suffering and, 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 you know, anyway, and he peters off into the distance there. 
So there's a lot there from Ian Bailey. I'll start by saying he says he's set in context and then sets no context whatsoever, but tells a story, gets across what it is that he wants to get across. Uh, Laura, you'll be a fan of this one. I spot some more present tense there um, where he says, I've nothing to do with this sad, sad murder. Not I had nothing to do, but it's in the present tense, which is potentially fine. But just think about if you had, uh, if you didn't make breakfast on Sunday, if someone else made breakfast for you on Sunday and you're talking about it now, would you say, I've had nothing to do with breakfast on Sunday? Or would you say, I had nothing to do with breakfast on Sunday? Or even more important, would you say, I did not make breakfast on Sunday, which would be much more direct. But Ian Bailey says, present tense, I have nothing to do with the sad, sad murder of Madame uh, de Plantier. Ian Bailey, also that I have nothing, uh, sorry, I have nothing to do with this is how he often phrases his denial. Very rarely does he say, I did not do this. I did not do this crime. I did not do this murder. I did not kill Sophie Toscan de Plantier. What he tends to say is, I have nothing to do with this, which is slightly different from saying, I did not do this. He also says, I have nothing on my conscience. And this is what I mean by him putting up what feels like at first look a robust defense. I have nothing on my conscience. But that doesn't mean that you didn't do it. If you say, I have nothing on my conscience, it doesn't mean you didn't do it. It means you may have done it. You don't regret it. That way you would have nothing on your conscience. I see this so much in Ian Bailey's words. He says words that sound like denials of involvement, but when you analyze which words he uses, they don't offer me any solace. They're usually about what he thinks rather than how he acted as well, which is, is very interesting to me. He talks a lot about what he thinks and what he knows, talks less about what he did or what he does. Now, all this stuff about what a great reporter he was, the lead reporter, he wants to, us to be really clear, he was the lead reporter. And he's a former Fleet Street investigator. For anyone watching from America, Fleet Street means the, the top of British newspapers. So he's really trying to get across his status here with all these words. You know, I was a very important person at the time. I was a, a Fleet Street investigator, worked with the Sunday Times, a big newspaper. Um, and again, I was the lead reporter on this story. Now, apart from getting across how important he is, well, why is he saying that? Well, the allegation is, at the time, that Ian knew a little bit too much about the murder for some people to be comfortable with. And Ian's explanation for that is, I was reporting on it. So, yeah, obviously, I knew more than most people because I was the reporter. I was getting the information, and that's why I knew more than most people. But he doesn't tell us why he's telling us all this, does he? He just, he just st states what he was, how important he was. So he doesn't set any context whatsoever. He's sort of giving like a half-baked alibi there, if you like, all about how important and talented he is. But he forgets to tell us that this is the reason why he was very closely involved in the events around the murder. And then the last bit, talking about the very, very hard, rough time and, and so on, man, it makes me feel like he is the victim of the murder uh, and not Sophie Toscan de Plantier. We move on. And this deals with, um, there's a guy called Billy Fuller who tells a story that Ian Bailey one night told Billy how Ian thought that Billy had murdered Sophie. And Billy's take on all this was actually, this was a, a sort of confession from, from Ian Bailey um, about how he actually did it. So this is put to him. And the question is asked um, of Ian Bailey, the central allegation that this conversation happened, did it happen first and foremost? Ian Bailey's reply is, no, no, he did. He did come up to the house briefly. I recall that, but the, what, he, what he said, but he also made a statement saying that I told him that Madame de Plantier and her lover or one of her lovers had come round to the prairie for dinner with myself and Jules. The prairie is the house that uh, Ian and Jules lived in at the time. He made that statement actually relatively, le relatively recently, I think last year. He again, reiterated it, complete and absolute nonsense. So what have we got here? He's asked, did this conversation happen first and foremost? And if you look on your screen there, the first two um, lines are taken up with him dealing with this allegation um, and answering the question, did it happen? And then the rest of it is all dealing with something that Ian Bailey has mentioned, a different allegation, a different story, which he denies, which he expands on a hell of a lot, and he denies much more fully. Why is that? 
Why did he not just directly address the question of did this conversation happen? Why does he move it on to something else? And how, look, at the question is about this first conversation. Did it happen? And he moves into talking about another allegation that was made and how this did not happen. It's complete and utter nonsense. He's walked a long way away from the premise of the question there. Why has he run away from the question to something else? That's an interesting question for me. I don't like the way he disparages Sophie there. Like he, could, like her lover, if he'd left it at that, I might not notice. But then saying one of her lovers as if to put down Sophie's character a bit there. Look, Ian, you're not the victim here. You're not the victim. Sophie is the true victim of what's happened here. The interview goes on around this Billy, Billy Fuller allegation. He's asked, so can you recall the conversation you had with him? And Ian Bailey says, N well, no, not exactly. But all I know is whatever Billy Fuller says is is has to be taken with a very big pinch of salt. So what we got from this one? Well, not exactly. Isn't the same as I can't. So can you recall the conversation you had with him? It's not, no, I can't. It's not exactly, which is I can, just not exactly. So again, we've got something that looks like a denial because it begins with, mm, well, no. And then it's not exactly. So he can recall at least some of the conversation that Billy Fuller uh, said to him. And then take him with a big pinch of salt. That's a saying that it doesn't mean what's being said is a lie. That's a saying that says you don't need to believe everything that comes out of that person's mouth. Not necessarily what's being said is a lie, but be careful because it might not be true. So again, something that's not a really firm, hard denial. Ian Bailey's then asked, but is it feasible? Feasible, you would have said something to the effect of you ever you did it. And Ian Bailey says, No, I don't think so. You know, this is this is 26 years ago. I can't remember exactly what was said, but certainly what Billy Fuller said, I said, was not the case. So that's what Billy Fuller said, I said, is not the case. So I don't think so. Well, that's not no, is it? It's either no or I don't think so. But again, it's a bit weak. It's, not this, it's the same as not exactly. It's not a strong denial. And I would like to know if you can remember exactly, you can't remember exactly what you said, so I can't remember exactly what I said. You can remember exactly what you didn't say. It's entirely possible, but he doesn't explain why he can say it's not, it, it's not the case. And again, if you look at it, he's telling us what he thinks, not what he did. Another allegation that's put to Ian is that he had had some contact or he knew or had met Sophie Toscan de Plantier before her murder. He's asked, is it possible, Ian, that you had some sort of contact with her? And, and he interrupts and he cuts the question off to give his answer. And his interruption once again begins with that stressful, I, 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 I stammer. He says, I, I, I am not aware that I did. You know, I, I, I didn't know her, as I've said. I've never, was never introduced to her. I think she was relatively quite private. I mean, a few people in the Mizzen Peninsula seem to know her. She was friendly with Tommy Malpass, Tommy Hungerer, and his wife Yvonne. But I don't think she was particularly well. No, she was quite, I think she was quite quiet and retiring. Well, we've got some stress there on the stutters on the eyes, but also some real typical Ian Bailey bull, if you notice. Ian's evidence that Sophie was relatively private is to name all the people she was friendly with. How does that work? Not quite sure. I'm interested in the first part. I'm not aware that I did. He doesn't say, if I did, I'm not aware of it. He doesn't say, I'm not aware if I did meet her. He says, I'm not aware that I did. I'm interested in that. He says, I don't know her and was never introduced to her. Not direct, not directly denying again that he had some sort of contact with her. Look at the question. Is it possible you had some sort of contact with her? Yes, it's possible I had some sort of contact with her, but I do not remember that. No, it's not possible. There's no way I would have remembered if I'd met her. Those are all plausible answers to this question. But I, I, I'm not aware that I did. And then... I didn't know her and I was never introduced to her. Let me tell you, there are many people in this world that I don't know, that I've never been introduced to, but I have had contact with them. So again, when you just look at the words that he chooses to use, whether he's chosen these very carefully to um, loophole and qualify what he says, 
or whether this is just the the automatic words that come out of us the, when we the words we think best fit the situation again it's not a strong denial so that blanket denial it comes apart again when you look at the word choice look at the distance again he's asked is it possible you had some sort of contact with her and he runs away from that and runs towards what sort of person Sophie was, a relatively quite, quite a private person um, who was friendly with some people. And no, I think she was quite quiet and retiring. It's again, the, the question, his answer ends up quite a distance from where the question was. Why is that? What is it about the questions that is being asked that makes him run from them? And also, again, I know people who are quite quiet and retiring or would be referred to as relatively private, I've had contact with them. So th again, none of this is proof that he had no contact with them. So why is that, this the, the strongest evidence that he can muster up to repute the question? Then we go on to this that I was talking about earlier. The allegation is you knew an awful lot very early and you've attributed that in the past to your sources. Is it fair to say you knew a lot? Is it fair to say you knew a lot quite early on? Ian says, well, I mean, I know you know what it's like when you're a journalist. You ask questions, don't you? You know, you know, I was I was asking questions. I was picking up strands of information and I was doing my job. And I'm, you know, I was a very good reporter and probably still could be. Once again, he doesn't directly answer the question. Is it fair to say you knew a lot quite early on? Yes, it's fair to say I knew a lot quite early on. I was reporting on the case. Or no, I didn't know more than anything else. Everything I knew, other people had told me. So um, lots of other people knew the same things as me. He doesn't give any explanation like that. He just tells us what it's like when you're a journalist. What's really interesting is, um, again, that he creates distance. He's asked, is it fair to say you knew quite a lot very early on? And he talks about what a good reporter he still could be. So again, he's running away from the question. And he, he only mentions the questions that he asked. He doesn't mention the answers, apart from saying he got strands of information, but that's not very substantial. Is it a strand of information? So if this excuse is to make any sense whatsoever, it's about the answers he was told, not the questions that um, he asked. Patricia has a really good point um, about the previous slide um, on, the, uh, on the comments. Patricia says, is Sophie shy and retiring or promiscuous? Make your mind up, Ian Bailey. Yeah, he said earlier, Sophie had have, have brought around one of her lovers, apparently, or didn't bring around one of her lovers. And then all of a sudden, she is shy, retiring, and quite um, quite shy, quite private. And yeah, Patricia, great point. And you'll see that a lot, especially if you listen to the full podcast interview, is he takes the tack that suits the answer that he's giving at the time. Here's a statement from Ian Bailey that happens in the podcast for you to look at. He says, people should ask themselves this question as well. If they've got any doubt, do they think that somebody who could have done this terrible, terrible crime could have survived for 26 years? To always, always fighting to clear their name. And you know, I went to UCC for a number of years, five years, and came away with three degrees in law. Could anybody who could have done that crime, you know, have survived as long as I have? I don't think so. I found this a very interesting statement. So first of all, the logic's awful here, um, as is the case quite often with Ian Bailey. Um, crimes remain unsolved forever. You know, the, the, the fact that the crime has remained unsolved does not mean there's any innocence whatsoever going around. And also, when you boil it down, his logic is, I must be innocent because I've said for 26 years I'm innocent. That doesn't hang together either. Notice the distance that he creates here. He doesn't say... Do they think I could have done this terrible crime and survive for 26 years? He talks about somebody. Do they think that somebody could have done this terrible crime? And at the end, he says, could anybody who have done that crime not, could I have done this crime and survived as long as I have? I don't think so. So he he's, he's really creating a bit of distance between himself and the crime here. The starting point in this logic is guilt. Do, you know, it's, it's all about guilt. It's not about how an innocent person um, would, would, would behave. It's about how a guilty person would behave. And his argument isn't, if I was guilty, don't you think I would have cracked by now and confessed? That's, that's just, it, it doesn't make any sense. That last line, could anybody have done that crime and survived as long as I have, almost feels like a boast. And notice he uses the word survived, is it twice? Survived 26 years, survived as long as I have. It's not endured. It's not put up with. 
it's survived, survived as long as I have. I think there's more in that statement as well. If anyone spots anything in that uh, statement from Ian Bailey as well, it just, it's extremely weak to me. It's again, it's put up like this robust, no brainer of a question. And when you pull apart the word choice and you pull apart the logic behind it, it just goes, it just is extremely weak. So if you've got anything on that, leave it in the chat or put it in the comments, please. And by the way, Patricia, if you're spotting contradictions, um, just look at the way he calls it a terrible, terrible crime in the, this statement. Time to do some YouTube stuff. If you want more videos like this, then hit the subscribe button and you will get notifications, especially if you hit that bell button. If you hit the like button, then that enables more people to find this video and spreads the word about what's going on here. As I say, comments and live chats are always very welcome. And if you share this as well, it means it gets to more people. So if you could do any of those things, I would be very, very grateful. Do you want another statement from Ian Bailey? He says, my prayer. My prayer has always been for my sake and Josie's sake. And this is a bit indistinct, but I think it's mainly. So, and mainly the family's sake is the true identity of the murderer emerges before I mean, I'm getting older now, and you know, we're all getting older, you know, before I'm dead and gone. It'll be very nice. You hear of people, you know, who died that are branded and this and that and the other, and then, oh, sorry, I've gone on one slide too many. <laughs> this, that, the other. Then subsequently, it turns out they had nothing to do with it. Well, it can't really help you out when you're dead, can it? Can anybody tell me what Ian Bailey's prayer is? I, I really, you know, I really can't make it out from the words. He starts saying things and then he stops and starts saying other things. He doesn't He doesn't seem to be able to fluidly uh, just get this prayer across in really the language that flows. There's no flow here whatsoever with his his prayer. He wants us to believe, I think, that his prayer is that the killer is found before he dies so Ian Bailey can live to see his innocence proved. But he just doesn't say that out loud in any way whatsoever. Why can he not just say that out loud? And then the interviewer asks, but is that vindication important to you? And Ian replies, very much so. I mean, I'll fight till my final breath, you know, to try to do whatever I can. And then we get this. If you say you'll fight to your final breath, that means you're going to be fighting until you die. You're, is this a fight you do not think you are going to win? I will fight till my final breath. Interesting, interesting. The mindset there that he thinks he's going to be fighting until his final breath. Not he's going to be fighting until the murderer is uncovered, but he's going to be fighting until his final breath. And fighting to do what? To try to do whatever I can. That's extremely weak to try to do whatever I can. Doesn't mean very much, does it? This is where it gets interesting. The interviewer says, what is your wish for the person who carried out the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier? Do they deserve for the rest of their lives? Ian Billy interrupts. Are they still alive? I mean, that's the big question. Now, the interviewer's done his homework here. This is an interrogator's favorite question. It's supposed to be a big tell. Interrogators will say, an innocent person will say what they think the consequences should be for the person who carried out the crime. A guilty person will talk round the houses. Try it with your kids. If someone steals some cookies, ask your kids, what consequences should the person who stole the cookies face? And you'll soon find out who stole the cookies. I asked you at the beginning of this video, what did you think the consequences should be for the killer of the Idaho for? Uh, what did you answer? I'm guessing lots of people answered life in prison. I'm guessing a lot of people said jail without parole. Uh, some people may even have said the death penalty. What does Ian Bailey do when he's asked, what, uh, what do you wish for the person who carried out the murder of Sophie Toscan de Plantier? Are they still alive? I mean, that's the big question. Yeah. Laura, Helen, yes. Answering a question with a question is never a great sign. It's buying time to think, or it's trying to, it's usually buying time to think actually, but it can be a bit deflective as well and hoping that the, the question will be answered. The question you've asked will be answered and we'll move away from whatever it is that you don't want to directly answer. So what does Ian Bailey do? He just says, are they alive or not? Interesting, if you had listened to the full podcast, then um, the, he does mention two people that could be suspects. And they're both dead, which is interesting. 
Um, so when Ian Bailey has put his big question, well done to the interviewer. He doesn't get derailed. He says, so what fate does the person who carried out this murder, what do they deserve? And Ian says, well, I mean, there's a police cold case review. I'm not, you know, I don't know how that's progressing. I'm hoping that it will lead to the identification. And if they're still alive, the apprehension of the person responsible for this. And, you know, then it will be a matter of law after law, wouldn't it? Why the continual avoidance of the question? What fate does that person deserve? And he talks about a police cold case review. And no, this is interesting to me. He doesn't state that he wants justice. He doesn't say he wants to see the person who kills Sophie jailed or punished. He wants them identified. He says he wants the identity to emerge. He doesn't talk about the person being found. He doesn't talk about proof the person did this. He doesn't want the crime to be proved or solved. It's almost like he only wants another name out there. The interviewer presses on. He's not letting this one go. But I'm only asking your personal opinion. And if you ask, if you ask that question, most people would say, oh, that anyone who carries a murder, it's a heinous crime that they deserve life. To, uh, they deserve life to spend, Ian interrupts again. I mean, if it's identified who is the murderer and the murderer is still alive, they will become subject to the criminal justice system, guests to this country and face whatever consequences, you know, a court decides they should face. It's out of my hands. I mean, I might, as I said, I my hope and my prayer has always been that one, the identity of the killer will come out. Although I would, and Jules, you see, Jules has been implicated in this. I mean, the Netflix documentary sort of implies she's somehow shielding a party to, you know, this. And she isn't, or she's not, is what he says. So he's doing this safer ground thing again. Look, he's asked, um, you know, I'm asking, I'm after your personal opinion. And he gives an opinion that it, the person should be subject to law of the land. That that's that's a truth. That's not an opinion. That's what will happen. Um, uh, you know, he's not saying they should spend life in jail or anything. It's just whatever consequences a court should decide. It's not up to me. It's up to someone else. And look at the distance that he's run from the question again. He's asked, "What should the consequences be?" or "What's your personal opinion?" And he ends up talking about how horrific the Netflix documentary was to to Jules again. There's this victimhood thing going on with him. The interviewer says, I suppose I'm asking you more a personal question here, Ian. In terms of, you know, this was a horrible crime. This woman suffered a violent and horrific death. Fair to say, yeah? And Ian says, well, if you've been paying attention as you've gone through this, Ian says, well, at the start of a few questions, you'll hear even more in the podcast. In the answers that he gives that start with well, he's using it to signify that he disagrees with the premise of the question or he's going to explain how it really is, why the question is not good, why, why actually, you know, there's something more important going on in here. And that's the response he gives to this. It's fair to say this woman suffered a violent and horrific death. Fair to say, yeah. And he says, well, no, that's a yes. That is a yes answer. Straight out yes should be coming from most people's minds. But he says, well, the interviewer presses on. What are your thoughts on the person, a person who was capable of carrying out that type of offence? Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really give it too much thought. As I say, I don't know if the person is still alive. If they are, then, you know, it would be good if they could be brought, caught and brought to justice. So we do have a desire for justice now, which is, is good to see. He's answering the question that was asked before because um, he's asked, is it fair to say it would be a horrific death? Um, and he doesn't answer that. What are your thoughts on the person? And he says, I wouldn't give it much thought, but he says it would be good if they were brought to justice. At the beginning of this video, I asked you, what were your thoughts on the person who killed Gabby Petito? And I'm sure you had lots of thoughts on the person that killed Gabby Petito. Most of them would be what a horrible person he was. I think there's a lot around him being controlling or, you know, uh, just just killing someone in the most horrible and brutal fashion and someone that she trusted as well, a breakdown of trust, just a horrible person. Some people may have been thinking about trying to understand what was going on with him and, uh, you know, like what was it that caused him to be such a horrible person? But I'm sure you had an, uh, something that went straight on in your mind when I asked you, what do you think of the person who killed Gabby Petito? You had an answer that, that, that jumped to mind. I don't think it would be, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't really give it too much thought would it? Um, it was him. Uh, yeah, great name. 
Welsh. Um, sorry, I'm just going to check this one. Is one that can actually go on? Uh, yeah, he can't agree. Sophie suffered a, a horrific and violent death. That is, yeah, exactly right. A yeah, brilliant spot. The interviewer then delivers a hell of a question. Is that person evil? Is that person a monster? You're you're not using those words. I'm not trying to put those words in your mouth, but that's certainly what I would say. If you ask me that question, someone who's capable of carrying out that type of crime and gotten away with it for so long, it's an act of evil. They're an evil person. They clearly have no morals. What do you say? What does Ian say? Well, I would, would, you, I, I would agree with you on that. You see, I mean, the thing is, I have a life, okay, outside of this. You've just taken me back to things that happened, you know, over a quarter of a century ago now. At the same time, I mean, I'm I'm prepared to assist and I will assist the Garda. The Garda is the Irish police for anyone that doesn't know. I will assist the Garda in any way that I can, if I can. And I would hope it would, it would be some sort of resolution, you know. And in the meantime, my life goes on. I've got new projects on the go. I try to be as creative as I can. And sometimes are more difficult than others. Sometimes it flows. My priority at the moment is to get my podcast done and dusted and out of there. Wow. From being asked if the killer has more morals or is a hideous person, he manages to move to promoting his podcast. That's quite a move. That's quite a run away from the question. What do I spot in the words that he's got? Well, he says, I would agree with you. No, I do agree with you. That's a very qualified word, isn't it? Would. I would agree with you. Notice earlier when he was talking about his prayer, by the way, he called it a terrible, terrible crime. Now, when that's expected of him, he seems to be unable to dig out these words. I would agree. It's just not a direct, I agree. It's, it's more, there's no direct condemnation there. He just says, I would agree with you. Also, um, and some of the answers, he's acting like he's near death. I haven't got long to go. We're all, we're all aging. And, you know, I hope this is done before I die. But now he seems full of life. Um, who was it? Patricia? All the what, saying what he says that suits the image that he wants to portray. This is absolutely one of those times where all of a sudden he's full of life and needs to get a podcast out. That's much more important than condemning the murder of Sophie or the person who murdered Sophie. There's one last question. Do you ever think about what happened to Sophie and what she suffered? And does that ever affect you? I know you say it's nothing to do with you, but given your closeness to the case and knowing what you know and knowing what she went through, just as a human being, do you ever think, you know, what happened to her was horrendous? Oh, of course it was horrendous. Of course it was, you know. And I prayed, I prayed for, you know, I prayed for her, particularly at the anniversary date of the, of the crime. You know, once again, I'm just going to reiterate this. I had nothing to do with it. I have nothing on my conscience. I do hope it is solved before I'm done and gone. I think you get the picture with that answer. It's time for me to come to some conclusions. If you've got anything you want to say, get it in the live chat now, and we'll cover that at the end after my conclusions. So look, going through this, Ian Bailey avoids directly answering the questions that he's asked and moves on to tell the story that he wants to tell. Why is that? A lot of the time he's offering what sound like robust denials at the outset, but examining the words that he chooses to use shows these are paper thin. There's so many qualifications to what he's said. His extreme, and it was extreme reluctance to talk about the consequences for the killer or to condemn the person and the personality of the person who killed Sophie, they're concerning to me. Look, I love supporting the underdog. If you look at some of my other videos, I look at people who are under fire and under immense suspicion. I love being the one to say, there is nothing to see in these statements. This looks like innocent to me, but I can't do that here. In my opinion, these denials are unconvincing. For clarity, that's not the same thing as saying, I think Ian Bailey is a murderer. He wasn't asked questions about what he did that night. He wasn't asked enough direct questions about his involvement in the murderer for me to look at his words and assess what I think about them. Maybe if he was asked those questions, I could be reassured. All I can say is that the words he uses around this, around the situation, around what he's going through now are very curious to me. Let me be clear, I wasn't there. I don't know who murdered Sophie, but I would have to hear a lot more and a lot different from Ian Bailey to say his words reassure me. If you are researching Ian Bailey and you're going to interview him, if you've got him coming up in your podcast, don't ask Ian Bailey what he knows, please. Ask him what he did. I think those, the words he would use to, to, to describe that would be very revealing one way 
or the other. As I say, Ian Bailey has always denied he has had any part in the murder, and if that's the case, he will be able to give a full and credible account of his actions. That's all I got. If anyone's got any comments, now's the time to put them in the live chat while I go through some uh, some, some promotions. If you want to get in touch, if you want to email, if you want to get in touch socially, go to connect.neveratruerword.com. That's a great place to get hold of me. Posts.neveratruerword.com, more in-depth articles on how to analyze people's language and the words that they use to see what's really going on. There's a couple of books on sale as well. Books.neveratruerword, if you want to unskill, upskill yourself into looking behind the words people say to find out what's really going on. As I said, podcast.neveratruerword.com is uh, where you can hear the words of West Cork, which really goes in depth and looks at statements of people who claim to be witnesses, Ian Bailey himself, Jules Thomas too. That's podcast.neveratruerword.com. And on videos.neveratruerword.com, you can catch more videos like this, especially those ones that I love doing that I spoke about where I look at people who are under fire, under suspicion, and show you through the words they've chosen to use why they should have no heat on them whatsoever. Patricia says he will never publicly condemn the perpetrator, and we all know why. Well, he didn't um, condemn the perpetrator of his crime, and yeah, why is very, very interesting. And one other one that's come up there, it's out of my hands. Um, it could Yeah, it's out of my hands is that he is no longer in control of the situation. I don't think he's ever been in control of the situation, to be honest, but uh, yeah, using the phrase, it's out of my hands, does show that he is no longer, he is not, and he knows he is not in control of the situation. But I think from the way that he uses his words, from the way he runs away from the questions, from the way he has prepared stories to tell, he would like to be in control of the situation. Thank you very much for your comments. It's been brilliant um, to, to hear them. Some great spots tonight. And I'll see you again sometime for another video from Never a Truer Word.